So we're carrying on in our series in the Gospel of Luke. We're in Luke chapter 7, and so if you want to turn there with me, you can look at Luke chapter 7. And we're looking at a very unique story here in that it's about a funeral, and Jesus and his disciples are kind of coming up upon this funeral processional. And so it's Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 17. If you don't know where the Gospel of Luke is in the beginning of your Bible, there is a table of contents. Please use it, because by doing so, you're going to find out where more things are in the Bible. So, uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 17. Now, as we look, about, look at this story, we're looking at a very unique funeral. It's a story of a funeral which ended much earlier than expected. Uh, so Jesus comes in and he just kind of disrupts this processional. And you may be surprised to discover that this passage will lead us to be more grateful uh, for God's blessings in our lives. And so let's take a look at it. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 17. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. He approached the town's gate. Uh, as he approached the town's gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. And then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for our time together, and I pray, Lord, that as we look into your word, that we're going to be able to see things here that will uh, draw us even closer towards you and help us to understand uh, your desire for the good in our lives. In your pray name I pray, Lord. Amen. So we're just going to dive right into this one. One of the things that we notice immediately is, is, in terms of the context of the passage, is that Jesus is walking along with his disciples and a large crowd. So to some extent, you could say, he had a processional with him. And, and they come in and they come to this community called Nain, this small town called Nain, and there's a processional, a funeral processional coming out. And so the two processionals meet. And one of the first things we see here in Jesus noticing this woman who just lost her son, she's a widow, is that he has compassion on her. Now, I don't know what happened to this only son who lived in Nain. Like, I don't know how he, he passed away. What we do pick up on here is that here's this funeral, and we're told that there's a large crowd. There's a funeral processional, and it would be headed by uh, professionals, actually. Like, so in ancient Israel, there were people, and this is something that you could deep dive uh, into a little bit later if you wanted to, but there were people who were paid uh, to do certain practices as related to things like worship and funerals. Now, one of the things that were common, um, and it's certainly common to our day as well, is that they had professional musicians. And, and that's not an uncommon thing, but unique here is that they also had what you would refer to as professional wailers, people who would be crying out in anguish as this processional is moving along. So these people would be at the forefront of the processional. There would be flutes and cymbals and utterings, and it just seemingly like almost like a frenzy, and these cries of grief would be pronounced and they'd be loud. You know, it's an interesting thing because we, we recognize naturally that death brings sorrow. Unexpected death brings even greater sorrow and shock that accompanies that. But I think one of the greatest sorrows is the death of a child, right? Like it's just something that's unique and it's different, probably because we... Um, we just see that in, in the young that there's so much more potential in life and, and future and that kind of stuff, right? And so it's, it's unexpected. It's horrible enough to lose a child, but it's especially true in the time of Jesus. Women didn't work like they do now. Their primary role was the family and the home. And so there was no such thing as social assistance in those days. The, the retirement plan for widows was their sons. And, and so you can imagine here that in this case, we're told that the woman was already a widow, 
with the death of her son, this woman was basically left to beg um, for food and for money from family members. And if she wasn't able to get it from family members, then she was going to be on the streets. Her means of support and security were gone. Now, I want you to picture that for a moment. This woman didn't just lose her son. I mean, certainly that is the most significant piece of this for her, I imagine. But she also lost her means of life. She was going to likely become destitute if family members didn't come in and, and bring some aid to her. And so what was going on here was a sorrow that had with it implications that lent itself to even greater sorrow. She was in a hard place, devastated in life. And as this funeral procession was heading to the, seminary, uh, to the cemetery, Jesus, his disciples, and entourage were following them, um, following them coming into the city. And then we see one of the most powerful words in the, ne- in the text. When Jesus sees her, his heart went out to her. Now, I want you to note first here is that Jesus saw her. Now, this woman who had suffered such great loss must have felt very invisible, must have felt distant and and she may have believed that her life was over. She may have concluded that God didn't care about her or all these bad things would not have happened to her. I mean, isn't that a natural question we have? Why is all this happening? What did I do? Does God even care? She may have felt invisible, but Jesus saw her. This is not like you might see someone on the road and wave to you past them by. As you pass them by, Jesus truly saw her. He saw her heart and he saw her pain. Luke uses the strongest word possible to describe, to describe Jesus' compassion. The root word here comes from a word um, to refer to what is inside uh, a person, the viscera, it's the, the heart, the liver, the lungs. And, and so he, the sense here is that he saw into the depths of her being. It's not only true It's not only time that we read this in the Gospels, actually. We see that Jesus sees the lepers. He sees the lame, the demon-possessed, the blind. He saw the tax collectors. He sees the woman who had been caught in adultery and even saw the Samaritan woman at the well one day. It could be said of Jesus that he saw people. And his response to her after seeing her was, don't cry. Not a command. Not a glib statement, but a statement of compassion. At first, the words may have sounded, like I said, glib or trite, maybe kind of an awkward cliche that people say when they don't know what to say. Now, if you've ever had loss in your life, you know some of the very awkward and very uncomfortable moments that can come with that, where people may say things and, 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 and they're trying to mean well, but it doesn't always come out well. Jesus wasn't being trite. He had a good reason to tell the woman not to cry. Now, I I wouldn't be surprised if some of you feel invisible today. Perhaps you have struggled in life. Maybe you've suffered great losses. Maybe you've experienced some great failures, and it seems as though others have turned away from you. Maybe you have an illness, and others are being pulled away in anticipation of your death. If you fall into this category, just please understand that Jesus sees you and he desires to enter into your world with you. And some of you might feel a different kind of invisibleness. Maybe you've had some success in life and you know the idea of popularity has come up and everyone views you as important. But however, people see only what you can produce. They may not see the real you. Maybe they take you for granted. Maybe you feel that the expectations are so high that you got to keep up some kind of facade all the time. You got to put the game face on all the time. Though everyone seems to like you, you may still feel like no one really sees you. The real you, the person who struggles with insecurity, is afraid that they can't meet all the expectations. But Jesus sees you, whatever your scenario, just like he sees this woman. 
And he understands. And even though we may feel so alone in the world, we're not. The Lord sees, he hears, he understands. And Jesus has compassion. And this is a reason to be grateful. And so he sees her and he sees us. In addition to that, we see in the story that this son was dead. The second thing we notice about the account is that the woman's son was dead. We don't know how he died or how old he was. Jesus refers to him as a young man. And so this typically is in that age range of like 25 to 35, somewhere in there is considered a young man. But we don't actually know how old he was. He was being carried probably in something like a wicker kind of carrier that was open. Uh, the scripture refers to it as a coffin, but, but it's a different kind of coffin than what we might be used to when we refer to caskets here. Our text tells us that Jesus went up to the carrier, to this casket, to his coffin, and he touches it. This is significant. Like today, lots of people touch caskets as they attend visit, a, a visitation or pass the casket one final, for one final viewing. In those days, nobody did that. That would be a very unique thing. To touch a coffin was, in essence, to touch this dead body. And and Jews didn't touch a dead body because if they did, especially rabbis, because you would be ceremonially unclean. And so you would have to go through this process of, of cleansing. And so the idea that Jesus, a rabbi who is leading a troop of people, to come over to a casket and touch it, to be that close to a dead person, would make him unclean. And yet, for the sake of this woman, who he sees in her anguish, he does something that is countercultural. The Old Testament law said that anyone who touched a dead body would be unclean for seven days. Jesus touches the coffin and then spoke to the young man, and he says to him, get up. Now, in your mind, I want you to imagine what that might have looked like, and, you know, on the face of all the people when Jesus speaks these words. It's a processional. The mom is there. Presumably, there are other family members. There's friends. There's, there's worshipers. There's all kinds of people in this processional. And Jesus touches this casket, and he says, get up. What would you be thinking if that happened in a processional you were a part of, a funeral that you went to? What would you be thinking if this kind of thing happened? Now, some may have looked on with disgust because they may have felt that this was a cruel thing to say. Others may have had the look that says, you are just out of your mind. And perhaps you've seen a, a fire of anger in the eyes of others as they contemplated moving Jesus away by force. And in fact, as you look At the disciples, even, you may have even seen some confusion. Some even maybe dared to look with a look of expectation. What's going to happen next? We're told the dead man sat up and he began to talk. And my question would be like, what would I do if I were there? What would I do? Did you ever wonder what he said? Did he speak to Jesus? Did he say, where am I? And where, who are all these people? Did he praise the Lord? Did he know who Jesus was? Did he have any recollection from the other side of the grave? All questions that I think naturally would have come up. And, and yet sometimes I, I wonder as I read this passage where he began to talk, did he just simply ask, where's my mom? Where's my mom? I wonder if his mom looks stunned but overwhelmed with joy. And there must have been many raised eyebrows, lots of mouths open in wonder. And you may not see it at first, but this story could just as easily be our story. You see, we we don't always relate these stories fully to the gospel message, but but it truly is related, that is. You may not see it at first, but this story could easily be our story. You and I were spiritually dead. We were headed to the cemetery, even though a journey may take another 60 years, it doesn't matter. That's the trajectory. 
That's just where we're headed. Ephesians chapter two, verse one says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And when you drop down to verses four and five, it says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. When we were dead in transgression, it is by grace you have been saved. And so Paul doesn't say that we were sick. He says oh, well, that we were dead. Like, it wasn't that we weren't paying attention or not trying hard enough to connect with God. We literally were dead spiritually lifeless, headed for hell. We were that young man, spiritually lifeless. We were dead. There was absolutely nothing that that young man was gonna be able to do to change his scenario. He needed Jesus. Jesus steps into our lives and he brings us to life. He made us spiritually alive. The, the theological term here is regeneration. It's that we were made alive once being alive, we died, we're made, more alive, we're made alive again. And because of his work of bringing us to life, we're able to believe in Jesus. Because of Christ's work through the Holy Spirit, we went from spiritual death to spiritual and eternal life. Now, this is the work of the Holy Spirit in, in the world around us. We know that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, and in doing so, we, we're drawn towards Jesus. We, we desire him, we, we choose him, but he initiates the work. And so we find here then that the next part of this story is these tender words from Jesus. He gave him back to his mother. She had experienced great loss. And she had no means of really taking care of herself in the future. And so her son is given back to her. I mean, any parent who has watched a child go through some life-threatening illness or a surgery or anyone who's waited anxiously for the result of a medical test of their child understands what this mother, to some extent, may have felt. I mean, don't you wish you knew what happened to the woman next to them after this? Or even the boy? Did they become followers of Christ? Did they become followers of Christ? Like, did they mourn when they heard of his death? Did they smile and look at each other with a knowing nod when they heard of his resurrection? How about this one? Like after Jesus resurrects Lazarus, the religious leaders want to kill Jesus and Lazarus, but there's no mention of them wanting to kill anybody else that Jesus raised from the dead. So was there a fear? A after hearing about Lazarus being pursued to try and take his life, that their lives would be in danger as well? Did they put their hope and trust in him and discover that ultimate resurrection? Well, I guess we'll have to wait and see the answer to that question on the other side of eternity, right, when we get to meet them. But there are some applications to this story that I think are, more, are important. I don't want you to miss the response of the crowd. They were filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. You hear that? God has come to help his people. In this midst of this anguish that this woman was experiencing, God has come to help his people. Jesus didn't just stumble across a funeral processional. It's not as if he didn't know. He came to help his people. You know what those people that, sorry, you know that when those people went home, someone asked, how was your day? And they had some story to tell. They praised God because they knew something extraordinary had happened. They had seen the dead person come back from death and they would never forget it. Neither should we. I mean, I think sometimes you read these accounts of Jesus' life as if they're just stories out of some kind of fiction book, but the reality is, is that these things happened. He came to help his people. And like these people, we should be eager to share the story with anyone who will listen. When we sit before God and consider the reasons to be grateful, we should have a long list. Like maybe, maybe there are these things that we refer to as material blessings, like food, clothing, a job, a home, security. God's come to help his people. 
and we should praise him for that. Their relational blessings, right? Our parents, siblings, spouses, our children, friends, neighbors. But more importantly, there are spiritual blessings. Like we have God's word. This is, this is a unique document in all of history that, that we get to encounter. The presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a spiritual blessing. Like the presence of God with us daily. They had to wait for God to come to them. As a believer in Jesus, God is with you daily. The gifts God has given for works of service. The people who make up the church. But this blessing, the blessing that's so easily overlooked is the one that should provoke the deepest sense of gratitude. We were dead, but have been brought to life in Christ. We were dead, but we were brought to life in Christ. We were not significant, and Jesus saw us. It's an interesting thing. I don't view myself as a person who's terribly significant in the world around me. There are billions of people on this planet that doesn't make me exceptionally um, some kind of outlier that, that I should be well known in any way. I'm not insignificant to Jesus. He sees me. He knows me. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. And because of the work that he did on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, he changes us. So even if life is hard right now, even if finances are tight, our health is shaky, even if our relationships have crumbled and the whole world seems to be rejecting us, no matter what our current situation, if we have come to a life-giving knowledge, uh, the acceptance of Jesus in our lives, if we are a follower of Jesus, we are a child of God, we're adopted into his family, we have more reason to be grateful than we have breath to express that gratitude. It's the good news of this short story, but it's a profound story for this woman, for this young man, and for us. I mean, listen to what they said. A mighty prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people today. God has come to help his people. And isn't that the story of the gospel? The story of the gospel is that God has come to help his people. Be encouraged today and consider all the things to be grateful for. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for our time together. And I pray, Lord, that as we looked into your word here, even in the short time that we spent here, Lord, that we would see the truth in it, that you intentionally enter the spaces that we're in. You have come to give help to our greatest need, which is separation from you. And you draw us towards you. And I thank you, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit that you sent after you ascended, that we who are your followers have you with us indwelling, your indwelling spirit with us daily. And so, Lord God, would you help us to be a people who are mindful of that and not get distracted by all the other things in this life that are important, but, Lord God, that we would not usurp what is most important, what is ultimate, to cater to the things that are important. Lord God, that we would remember that in the midst of everything that we're experiencing in life, you are ultimate, you are present, and you give aid to those who are your children. In your name I pray. Amen.